There's a scene in the 2007 adaptation of Hairspray in which Tracy tries to convince her mom to get out of the house. Edna, her mom, hasn't left the house apparently since 1951 and has gained a significant amount of weight since then and is self-conscious about the neighbors seeing her. Tracy then tells her that it's changing out there and that people who are different, their time is coming. People who are different. Interesting choice of words. Just to make sure that nobody who's different, who's black or Chinese, or maybe who needs to lose a few pounds. There's that word different again. I'm just glad she didn't say black, white, or purple. So shout out to the writers for sparing us that lazy liberal piece of shit line. <sighs> Hairspray is weird, and it has a very weird message. Although on the surface, it doesn't seem so. On the surface, the message is about being colorblind and people judging each other based on the content of their character and not the color of their skin, blah, blah, blah. Who could be mad at a message like that? Well, me. The answer is me. I love Hairspray. From the original 1988 version to the 2007 adaptation that gave Nikki Blonsky her 15 minutes of fame. However, I do feel like the messaging in Hairspray is kind of all over the place. But before I tear into the messy narrative of Hairspray, I should talk about one of the main reasons it's still so important to me and many others. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to introduce someone very special, a brand new council member making her first appearance on the show, and we already have telegrams. Why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, Corny. I I'm Tracy Turnblad, and I go to Merville High. In Aubrey Gordon's What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Fat, she says, So many portrayals of fat people make our bodies into morality tales. Warnings of the dangers of assumed gluttony or imagined sloth. Our bodies are consistently depicted as befores, forever yearning to become afters. But hairspray bucks that trend. Tracy Tumblad's character development doesn't hinge on weight loss, remorse for letting herself go, or guilt for her size. She is not a tool to stoke audiences' disgust, condescension, pity, or rage. She does not stand for anything, is not a symbol of capitalism run amok or self-loathing, not a representation of bloated wealth or lazy poverty. Tracy simply stands for herself. Hairspray will always hold a special place in my heart simply because of Tracy. She was a one-of-a-kind character. Sure, we had Roseanne, which came out the same year, but that show made it pretty clear that we were not supposed to see Roseanne Connor as desirable. Tracy is special because she is the perfect heroine. She's an outsider, but doesn't seem to be aware that she's an outsider. She exudes so much confidence and self-assurance that you almost forget that she only has one friend. She knows that she can dance, she isn't afraid to flirt with guys that some people may say are out of her league, and she does not doubt her ability to achieve what she wants. We should all want to be like Tracy. However, I do think our love for Tracy has maybe distracted some of us from the fact that Tracy is, at the film's core, a bona fide white savior. And some of the things she says and does in the films and the Broadway show are deeply problematic and kind of offensive at times. Being invited places by colored people feels so hip. This is just so Afrotastic. I wish, I wish I was dark skinned. Tracy, our souls are black, even though our skin is white. Now I know some of you will say it's just a joke. I understand that it's supposed to be a joke. We are meant to laugh at Tracy in these scenes and not with her. But this to me gets into exactly why I had an issue with Tracy saying this shit. People who are different, their time is coming. Many of you might be wondering why I'm so fixated on that particular line. Like, duh, she obviously means people of color and people who don't fit into the conventional standards of beauty like her. Sure, on paper, that's what she's saying. But what is she really saying? You see, Hairspray isn't just a story about a fat teenager who gets on her favorite dance show and steals a skinny blonde's boyfriend. It's also a movie about race. Halfway through the film, Tracy basically achieves her dream, getting on the Corny Collins show. But there's just one problem. It's an all-white show with the exception of Negro Day, which is a special on the Corny Collins show, where, on the last Thursday of every month, the entire show is populated by black dancers, black performers, and is hosted by a black woman named Motormouth Maybell. 
Tracy loves Negro Day. Negro Day is the best. I wish every day were Negro Day. When Tracy gets on the show, she expresses how much she wishes Negro Day could be every day. This, of course, alarms all the managers at the station who are racist and don't want the show to be integrated. Those of you who may not know, Hairspray is loosely based on some true events. John Waters based it on the Buddy Dean show, which was a local dance show in Baltimore that aired from 1957 to 1964. WJZ, the station that aired the show, were apparently being pressured to integrate the show, and so they decided to cancel it. John Waters said in an article for the Washington Post, Certainly all the stuff in Hairspray didn't happen for real, but it was my fantasy of how I wished it would be, not what really happened. Because they didn't integrate in reality. It didn't have a happy ending. So how does Tracy's otherness tie into this? Well, Tracy is fat. I shouldn't have to explain that fat people are treated pretty terribly in our society and always have been. Anti-fat bias is real whether people want to admit it or not. The fact that Hairspray addressed fat shaming and fat phobia in 1988, no less, is pretty incredible. In the Broadway show and the 2007 adaptation during the Baltimore Crabs number, Mrs. Von Tussle and the rest of the council all immediately reject Tracy without even giving her a chance. They're simply rejecting her based on her size. Again, I shouldn't have to explain this, but this is a form of discrimination. Now, is Tracy's experiences with anti-fat bias the same as racist oppression? I'm gonna say no. There's a scene in the 1988 Hairspray where a race riot breaks out at Tilted Acres where the Cordy Collins show was filming that day. And we see poor seaweed being physically beaten by cops. Yes, Tracy does get sent to reform school for trying to protest, but she's not exactly getting her head bashed in with police batons. Yes, Tracy is made fun of for her weight, but she still ends up on the show and becomes a local celebrity. There's this really odd but kind of interesting comment that John Waters made in a mini documentary on the 2007 Hairspray DVD about the origins of Hairspray. A movie about outsiders, black people, and immigration, then what's even further? I think a fat girl gets more hassle than a black girl. I think if you ask any really fat people, they say they walk down the street and no one looks at them. Okay, I'm gonna need to unpack that for a minute. For one, he's saying that fat girls get treated worse than black girls as if fat black people don't exist. And two, that last sentence isn't even true. You can ask any fat person, and they will tell you that being fat doesn't exactly make you invisible. In fact, it makes you hyper visible. I found that comment to be pretty stupid, honestly, because the treatment of fat black women is significantly worse than that of fat white women. Just look at the way people treat Lizzo. I understand what he's trying to say, but implying that fat people are somehow treated worse than black people, as if racism and fat phobia aren't intertwined, is very ignorant. Fairing the Black Body by Sabrina Strings provides a deep and complex look into how the origins of fat phobia stem from systemic racism. Aubrey Gordon also talks about this in her book, how even though over the past decade we've gotten a small portion of positive fat representation, most of that representation is able-bodied, white, cisgendered, and heterosexual. She says, the stories of fat white women are scarce. LGBTQ fat people, fat disabled people, and fat people of color are exponentially scarcer. So yes, Tracy is different, but she's still white, she's still privileged, and she doesn't really have a right to compare her experiences with that of people who are literally being beaten by cops or sent to detention for being black. Tracy didn't get sensitive attention for being fat. She got sensitive attention for skipping class. She enjoys going to detention when she sees how much fun it is, and honestly, I don't blame her. Wouldn't she want to go to detention if it was lit like this every day? However, the movie really doesn't acknowledge how fucked up it is that all the black kids are forced to go to detention because the school is racist. Like, we're supposed to feel good that they make the best out of a shitty situation by dancing and having fun, but it completely ignores the bigger issue here. There's also the fact that Tracy uses Seaweed's dance, which he calls Peyton Place After Midnight, when she gets on the Corny Collins show and doesn't even give him credit for it. And this isn't even presented as a problem in the movie because as I imagine, the writers didn't see it as a problem. I think one of my main issues with Hairspray is the fact that it tries to push this colorblind message. We shouldn't see color. We should all love each other and bake a cake filled with rainbows and smiles. <sighs> Here's the thing. Colorblind messages in films always come off as tone deaf because being colorblind in a systemically racist country means ignoring and dismissing the experiences of entire groups of people. I understand why a lot of people think they're being a good person by saying they don't see color, but at the end of the day, it's an empty statement because there's no possible way to not recognize someone's race in a racist society. 
I mean, I hope one day when racism is eradicated, we can be colorblind. It won't happen in my lifetime, that's for sure. But right now, and especially in 1962, where this movie takes place, saying you don't see color is very disrespectful and pretty insensitive to the people you want to be an ally to. Another aspect of the film that's deeply problematic, in my opinion, is the relationship between Penny and Seaweed. Something that I find interesting about the Broadway show and the 2007 adaptation is that Penny seems to be more drawn to Seaweed's blackness than she did in the 1988 film. In the 88 film, Penny just seems like she had a crush on Seaweed and was happy that he noticed her. She acknowledges his race and even becomes an ally to black people by also fighting for integration, but she doesn't fetishize him. I mean, Seaweed does make this really weird comment. Oh, Penny. My, my little white lily. Mm-hmm. But other than that, there's no, I've tasted chocolate and I'm never going back, or... Penny constantly fainting every time Seaweed touches her or does something sexy. Interracial relationships aren't exactly taboo anymore, but there's still a lot of aspects to interracial dating that we don't always talk about. Black men, especially dark-skinned black men, are often heavily fetishized and sexualized by non-black people. The trope of the nasty dark-skinned black man coming in and corrupting the pure and innocent white girl is still very prevalent. It depicts black men as exotic and animalistic at times. I mean, have you seen porn? Obviously, Hairspray is a family-friendly movie, so I'm not expecting them to talk about that, but incorporating that trope and making it into a joke to appeal to older white liberals isn't great. The emphasis on people being different, as if to lump every marginalized person and their experience into one category is very harmful and paints them with a very broad brush. I think it's great that Tracy's using her white privilege to help black people and fight for equality, but Tracy putting black people on a pedestal and seeing them through this monolithic view does not make her a good ally in my opinion. And making the many microaggressions that Tracy, Penny, and Edna make into cute jokes is again, not great. But to give John Waters Hairspray a little bit of credit here, his version definitely seems to be a little more self-aware of the plot's absurdity and doesn't take itself so seriously. About a year ago, HBO Max posted a video comparing the 1988 Hairspray to the 2007 Hairspray. What I noticed from the comments under that video is that most of the people commenting are partial to the 2007 version. This isn't surprising considering that John Waters' films tend to be more obscure and independent. The 2007 Hairspray was one of the biggest movies to come out that year, and it had a star-studded cast with the exception of newcomer Nikki Blonsky. And I presume most of the people who love the 2007 version are probably a lot younger and maybe weren't even aware that the 88 version existed. I'm only 24, so the only reason I'm aware of this movie and Ricky Lake is because of my mom. If you're familiar with John Waters' filmography, you know that his movies are a, um, acquired taste. The reason I love them is because of their camp and self-awareness. His movies aren't afraid to be absolutely absurd and over the top. The electricity makes me insane. Why, crybaby? Why? Here's why. Electricity killed my parents. Let's get naked and smoke. Cool. Something about the original Hairspray that I personally think makes it stand out is the fact that it really leans into that absurdist comedy. Like, there's a whole section of the movie where Mrs. Von Tussle puts a bomb in her hair and plans to throw it into the crowd at the auto show if Amber doesn't win the competition. There's a scene where Penny is being physically abused by a psychiatrist who is treating her due to her attraction to black men. Gross. (laughs) Black boys. And one of my all-time favorite scenes is when Prudy goes to the black side of town to search for Penny and is deathly terrified of every black person she comes into contact with. The scene ends with Prudy running to a cop car for help, but then immediately running away when she sees that the cop is also black. Also, there's a scene where we see Penny reading an African sketchbook. I'm like, okay. Now, I'm not going to act like this movie was some perfect commentary on racism or anything. It's still a movie written by a white man from a white man's perspective. But I do love the movie's commitment to making fun of racist white people. If you watch the movie, you'll notice that the kids on the Corny Collins show mostly play black music from the 1960s. It highlights how hypocritical it was that the studio and the racist white parents were totally fine with their kids dancing to black music, but not with black people. 
the 2007 version to me, as much as I love it and the music and cute little Nikki Bonsky, takes itself way too seriously. Like they're integrating a dumb TV show ran by a bunch of racist white people and the movie acts like the show getting integrated is ending racism or something. It also completely removes the underlying queerness and campiness of the original. It's very safe and tame and doesn't really take risks. Like in the Broadway show, Tracy gets arrested and then Link comes and breaks her out of prison with a can of hairspray. Adam Shankman, the director of the 2007 adaptation, stated in the director's commentary for the film that they felt it was a little too unrealistic to have Link in the movie break Tracy out of prison as if anything else that happens in this movie is realistic. Tracy sneaks into the Miss Hairspray pageant in a battery ram, but whatever. All I'll say about that is, if John Waters had directed this movie, he would have been able to make it work. And I would have appreciated this movie so much more if it had at least dared to be a little absurd. Also, the movie casting fucking John Travolta and putting him in a hideous fat suit is why this movie will always be inferior to the 88 version in my eyes. I mean, no one could possibly top Divine's performance as Edna, but John Travolta was grossly miscast here and I'll never understand it. I watched that tramp and I'm embarrassed to be white. Hairspray is fun. It's cute. It's campy. And I can't pretend that I don't have fun every time I watch it, whether it's the 88 version, the play, or the 2007 version. It's a fun, feel-good movie that, despite its cringy humor, still features one of the most iconic movie heroines. So I'm not here to tell you not to like Hairspray. The Help is another one of my favorite movies, and it basically has the same issues as Hairspray. It's important to always be critical of the things you love, but that doesn't mean you can't still enjoy those things. One thing I can give the 2007 Hairspray is that, unlike the Broadway show and the 1988 film, is it decided to have little Inez, Seaweed's little sister, win the Miss Hairspray pageant instead of Tracy. It's a really nice change to the story and it honestly made me wish that Hairspray's story could be rewritten in some way. Instead of focusing on Tracy, you could focus on little Inez trying to become a star instead. And maybe white people could just stop trying to write movies about racism while also centering the movie around a white person being the good white person. I'm not necessarily saying white people can't write movies about racism, period, but if you're going to, you need to actually consult people of color and have them involved in your process. It doesn't matter how much of a woke leftist you are, you don't know everything. Or better yet, just let people of color tell their own stories because, as a wise woman once said, People who are different, their time is coming. <sighs> I really hope so.